my version of musical chairs. I'm over there, now I'm here. I never know where I'm going to be. Anyway, <laughs> good morning, everyone. And uh, it's great to see you all here today. Um, in Psalm 92, it's, it speaks that it, it is good to praise the Lord. I was reflecting on that. It's good to praise the Lord. It's a good thing. Um, and that's just something that's worth reflecting on. As we come together as the body of Christ known as Ebenezer Baptist Church here today to lift up the holy name of Jesus in our praises. Um, with our singing voices, not everybody has a great singing voice. I know that. Some people do. Some people don't. But in our hearts, we lift him up. Amen. And uh, that's, that's great. So thank you for being here today. Welcome. And to those who may be watching online, welcome. Uh, and uh, what I'll do, just before we go to prayer, is I'm going to read a little bit of Psalm 92 to you, which speaks, uh, just as I was speaking before about it being good to praise the Lord, it starts, it is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night, to the music of the ten-stringed lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord. How profound your thoughts. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we come today to, to worship you, to acknowledge that you are God. We have made a deliberate act to come here today to gather around your word, to lift up our voices, to worship you. And Father, we just pray that you would bless and anoint this place with your Holy Spirit, that everybody in here, even those watching online, would be touched by the love of Jesus Christ in our lives. That's the power of Jesus Christ that is the power to change lives, uh, which, which we need. Lord, when we look at our world, we know we need, we need you, and we need changed lives, we need our lives to reflect you more and more. So Lord, again, bless each person who is here and yeah, be pleased with what you hear today, Lord. And we lift all this up to you in the holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. And what I'll ask you to do is to stand as we prepare for worship today. We'll sing a great gospel hymn. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Jesus. As I've done before, I'll give you a heads up on this one. It's going to start slow, but then it's going to get a little bit faster. So <laughs> be, be prepared for that. I'd like to say, Lord, from the start, thank you for breaking through. Thank you for breaking through my heart. 
fills. Nobody fills my heart like Jesus. Nobody fills me like you do. Nobody fills my heart like Jesus. Nobody loves me like you. a new song. We'll present a new song to you today. I think for everybody, the prayer needs to be, Lord, make me more like Jesus. So, if you don't know the song, which many of you will not, I hope you can pray this. Trading your 
a crown for a cross He willingly died Your innocent life paid the cost Counting your status as nothing The King of all kings came to serve Washing my feet Covering me with your love. More of you. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take Church. Morning. Scripture reading. Second Corinthians chapter four. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we not, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception. 
nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we recommend, we, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is bailed, it is bailed to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, may this light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surfacing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplex, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but light is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are, we are wasting our way, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That's the word from the Lord. Can we please have all the children come up to the front for their prayer, please? Okay, so... Uh, the Sunday School will be continuing the study upon the facts of Jesus that Meg had lessened, pardon, sorry, that Meg had mentioned last week, and we're going to be continuing these lessons for the next two weeks as a total of four lessons. And so, as for the Noah's Place, they will also be learning about Hannah's prayer for a child in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 9 through 28. So let us now bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, as always, 
We are forever grateful that you have brought unto us another day and the allowance of these kids to come here this morning to worship you and to learn more about you. As these, as these children continue to grow, we ask for your eternal protection and guidance that they may follow the path you intended for them and may they strengthen their trust in you and in your plans as well. We pray that these children continue to love you and to seek refuge in you, that they may cast all their worries and doubts away and to reach out to you in prayer. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. It's been a long time since I've done announcements. <laughs> so, it's good to see everybody today. Thank you for inviting me back again to speak. Um, there are a number of announcements. Please double check your bulletin. Uh, there is choir practice today. Uh, we'll meet in the choir pews after the service at 12 p.m. Um, we're looking forward to preparing for the Christmas season. So any of you who are interested in choir or who are in choir, uh, please be here back by 12 p.m. Challengers is on Wednesdays, meeting at 11 a.m. in the lower auditorium. Uh, Pastor Tony Tremblant speaking. Uh, bring a sandwich for lunch. Everyone is welcome. That's Wednesdays, 11 a.m. in the lower auditorium. The next Coffee and Prayer Fellowship Night is Friday, October 27th at 7 p.m. Uh, so please come to the parlor for a devotional time of prayer and fellowship. It's very good to stay in prayer. Uh, the Apostle Paul told us to pray without ceasing and nothing happens without prayer. But it's a wonderful time. Uh, it's very good. It's, there's nothing more intimate than growing together in prayer. It's the most intimate thing you'll ever do uh, with another brother or sister. And so please come out if you can, if you have the, make the time and come to prayer fellowship. Uh, youth and young adults, stay tuned for the next Youth and Young Adults Bible Study, and uh, you can talk to Meg for more information, I guess. And uh, there's also a joint youth event. Uh, this one, I think, is really cool. Um, November 4th from 6 to 10 p.m., uh, Ebenezer will be joining Bethany Baptist Church at their church in Richmond for their annual Clue Game. Now, I've been a Christian for... I don't know, 40-something years, and I've never been to a church that had a clue game. So if you know any young people that would be interested, uh, definitely get out to see that. Uh, if you would like to volunteer for the event or would be interested in driving youth to Bethany Baptist Church, also talk to Meg. Um, I think that'll be just wonderful. Uh, also, we have Operation Christmas Child coming up. Shoe boxes are here and ready to be filled. So... Uh, the brochures and shoeboxes are available in the Welcome Center. Um, they have instructions on what to do, the brochures do. Uh, the shoeboxes are going to be collected back on November 5th and November 12th, so you have till then to uh, get it all together. Uh, please see Mamta Mesquita for more information. Are there any announcements that I have missed? Or is that pretty much cover it? Okay. We have received so much from God at this time. I'd like to call the ushers forward that we may ask God's blessing on our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Our God and Father in heaven, we rejoice today because you have given us the most precious gift, yourself, and we possess all things through you, in you, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of the dwelling of the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit in our hearts. But we thank you, God, also for everything else that you have given to us, for the mountains, the trees, the stars in the sky, for the food that we take for granted, the running water, the electricity, the peace, the security, the freedom, all of these things, Lord. You bless us day by day. 
And you have taught us, Lord, through the Apostle Paul, that you love a cheerful giver. So teach us, Lord, to give just as you gave everything to us. We humbly ask your blessing on this offering in Jesus' holy name. Amen. The Lord is so good to us. Let us draw close to the throne of grace uh, in prayer and ask that the Lord shepherd us and continue to grow us. O oh, loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this sacred time. You have called us to be your sacred family. For Jesus said, Who are my mother and brothers? Whoever does the will of my Father is my brother and sister and mother. And so, Lord, we gather today, as imperfect and broken and sinful as we are, we come as your redeemed children, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, refreshed and sealed with re for redemption through the work of your Holy Spirit. We gather, Lord, as your children, as your family, to praise you, but also to receive more of you into our lives. We remember, Lord, that we live in a world that is filled with darkness. And so we ask, God, that we desire you all the more, that we might be filled with the light of Christ that shines into that darkness, that we might be willing and ready to bring that light to all who seek it. Help us to take these things to heart, to be humble and willing to be taught and shaped by your mercy, by your wisdom, by your grace at work in our lives. Heavenly Father, open our hearts to your word. Help us to avoid the distractions of this world, the temptations of the flesh, our pride, our greed, our lust, our envy, our resentment, anything that would be an obstacle to opening our hearts to receive you, to receive what you want to communicate to us. O oh Lord, great indeed is the mystery of godliness. May we truly seek that mystery in Jesus, your Son. May we seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work that you have entrusted to us as a church. We ask that you will continue to bless it. We ask your blessing on the youth ministry. We ask your blessing on the challengers ministry, on the music ministry, on all the different things that Ebenezer and her sister churches do together in concert for your glory and your kingdom. Lord, we pray for our missionaries overseas. We're mindful this week of Jeff and Sonia Kilmartin in Cameroon. We ask your blessing on them and the work they do. It takes great sacrifice 
to be a missionary and to go to foreign lands, to raise children in foreign lands. Uh, it takes unimaginable sacrifice and sometimes suffering. So please hold these people close to you, God. Protect them and guide their work that it may be fruitful and helpful. We thank you, God, for all the work that you are doing in the world. It is easy to be alarmed and terrified because we see things that are hard to comprehend. We see society upended through a total inversion of values, through the public proclamation of outright lies, through the consumption of those lies by many, many people. And we shudder to see minds corrupted by those lies. We shudder to see lives destroyed by iniquity, by wanton sin, by brazen rebellion against your mighty name and the work of your spirit. We see the effects of sin throughout our world in poverty, in grotesque conflict. We see atrocities. We see war. We ask today, God, that you bring back peace to the afflicted regions, whether we think of Ukraine or Israel and Palestine or places in West Africa where Boko Haram is active, uh, Yemen, there are many places, Lord. We pray for your justice and your peace. We pray for the rebuilding work that only you can bring. We pray for those nations that suffer under tyrants, where there may not be war, but there is a daily struggle to avoid wanton prosecution or uh, unfair treatment. There are many people who live in fear, Lord, and we ask that you send forth your spirit and renew the face of the earth with the saving word of your gospel, with the kindness, patience, and undaunted love that your children should show to those in need of your light. Help us, God, to truly be light bearers in this world, to pray without ceasing, to be persistent in doing what is good, to walk humbly, and to not be afraid, even though we will have to see terrible things. Let us remember that you are quick to forgive, you are quick to heal, your mercy is everlasting. And throughout all of this, your word stands firm. It is written in the heavens, and you will bring about a new heaven and a new earth through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Lord, please continue to shepherd us, be patient with us, cultivate in our lives the fruits of your spirit. We humbly ask in Jesus' holy name, amen. Again, thank you for welcoming me back. Uh, it's lovely to be here um, and worship together and to uh, share the gospel. I was supposed to switch this on. I'm a Luddite. Is that working, Azim? All right. It's caught on something. So earlier in the year, I shared with you some uh, images of God, uh, God washing our feet, um, things of that nature. And today, and in a couple of the next times I'm invited to speak, I would like to look at how God sees us. One evening in 1926, a man was lying sick in bed when somebody brought him a cracked stoneware vessel that had been repaired with lacquer and gold dust. Immediately, he was overjoyed. 
and uh, he, it was a rare find. He was overjoyed. He managed to acquire it. The man was the Japanese philosopher, Yanagi Soetsu, who collected folk art, wrote essays on its value, and he helped found the Japan Folk Arts Museum. During the Second World War, he spoke out against uh, imperialism, colonialism, and war. He was censored for it. Uh, though not a believer as we would understand it, he treasured the teaching of the church, and he frequently alluded to or quoted Jesus uh, in his writings. For him, folk art represented uh, something of the true beauty uh, of nature and the human spirit, spirit working together. Uh, when reading his essays earlier this year, I could not help but recall the words of the Apostle Paul, comparing uh, believers to common crafts like earthenware. And we read that this morning. For it is God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. Earthenware is one of the humblest and oldest crafts ever made by human hands. Almost every culture has practiced it, whether we think of the terracotta statues of the Etruscans or the Rakuyaki earthenware of tea ceremonies in Japan. In the time of the apostles, earthenware was an everyday item used to store olive oil, grain, wine. Um, we have plastic in our culture. They had earthenware. Uh, lamps were often made of earthenware. They were filled with oil and lighted to light homes. Uh, you, they, used to ha have, they used to have a number of them uh, at the Museum of Anthropology uh, at UBC. You could see old Greco-Roman, probably from the time of Jesus, little earthenware lamps. Uh, light is beautiful, oil is rich, delicious, uh, grain and wine taste wonderful likewise. Um, earthenware looks simple. It's very simple. It can be painted and decorated to look quite sophisticated, uh, but at the end of the day, it's just earth. That's all it is. It's not gold, silver, or even precious wood. It's clay. It can be found almost everywhere. Uh, it can be made almost anywhere, and it can be used for almost anything. And this is much like the nature of the church. Uh, for believers can be made anywhere and at any time God chooses, whether or not the conversions uh, make the news or the history textbooks. To the ancient Sumerian, Akkadian, and Hebrew cultures, earthenware was probably the closest thing to the matter of a human being. Uh, and the book of Genesis says that we were made of earth. Adam's name means earth as well as red. Uh, the Apostle Paul knew this naturally when he spoke of our carrying treasure in jars of clay. Though mortal, we're unfortunately all struggling with that condition, um, we carry immortality inside of us. This seems to be one suggestion the Apostle is making. And he says that at the end of the chapter that we just read, we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. And I think, especially in our culture today, it is a daily struggle to remember that, to look at what's eternal, to look at what's unseen. And following Jesus means just this. There is an inward renewal and a heavenward calling. Our home is not here. Uh, our permanence is not in the exterior, the material, or the immediate. Uh, unfortunately, in our culture, we're very much grasping of those things. We like the immediate, we like the exterior, we like the material. But our lives are hidden in Christ, in the treasure hidden in us. 
To what extent are we looking to the unseen and the eternal today? As I said, much of our religion today seems sometimes to be concerned with what is seen and temporal. And that's not our nature. And that's not our home. And that's not our treasure. Moreover, in speaking of earthenware, I believe Paul is stressing that the gospel and those who believe it, they're not sophisticated, not celebrated, they're not ornate. They are often anonymous, working behind the scenes, even seemingly irrelevant or obviously irrelevant to modern society. In the sixth chapter of the second letter to the Corinthians, same letter that we have our text from this morning, Paul says just that. He says, we're treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well-known, as dying and see, we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. Did you wake up this morning Aware that you possess everything? You do. Those who have the Lord have everything. This is the great paradox of our faith. Though we have immortal treasure, though we carry around the living God in our hearts, the creator of heaven and earth, we don't look like much. And if we look like much, maybe there's something wrong. Jesus warned about appearances. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! You clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees! First clean the inside of the cup so that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You're like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside they are full of the bones of the dead and all kinds of filth. So also on the outside, you look righteous to others, but inside, you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. The experience of being an outwardly clean bowl in a decorated tomb, whether or not it's ever obvious to others, is spiritual dying. It's a kind of misery. It's not living. It's not carrying around the glorious treasure that God, in his divine mercy, as entrusted to us. For God can never die, and God needs no decoration from you or me or anyone in the world. Rakuware, the simple earthenware that's highly valued and used in tea ceremony in Japan, is very simple, um, very beautiful, uh, and it's kind of unpredictable when fired. Some of us believers are kind of unpredictable when fired. Sorry, that's a bad joke. Never mind. Uh, it became an established tradition uh, with government approval in the 17th century. Um, but one glance at a piece, and you can see that it's not far removed from the earth. It looks, or common craft, it looks like something that came out of the earth. Um, and they were hand-shaped, um, not fancily shaped. In fact, it was first made by a roof tile potter named Chojiro. It's earthy, simple, yet it radiates something very elegant, transcendent, otherworldly. And sometimes I wonder if we as Christians are so busy trying to look heavenly, then we end up looking worldly. Um, perhaps if we were just humble enough to be earthy, uh, we would be more heavenly. And I, I know that probably doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense at first. It's something of a paradox. Um, and by earthy, I don't mean worldly or vulgar. Uh, I don't mean materialistic. I mean like Rakuware, humble, natural, simple. All of the great spiritual movements in church history came in simplicity. Uh, the first apostles, the desert fathers, the Franciscans, the Waldensians, the Anabaptists, even the first Baptists, all carried the treasure of the good news in very simple, very humble garb. In fact, uh, interesting historical side note, uh, many Anabaptists 
made and sold ceramics to survive uh, as they wandered from country to country uh, throughout Europe as they were avoiding persecution. Um, and for some time, again, the Museum of Anthropology here at UBC had a beautiful collection of their ceramics. I don't know if they still have that exhibit, but it was fascinating to see um, people that were carrying the gospel of God uh, throughout Europe and enduring untold persecution, uh, making things with their hands and firing them in kilns, necessary things. Uh, great movements and revivals have often been like this, simple yet powerful and sincere, like humble earthenware holding expensive, uh, fragrant, delicious tea, uh, like earthenware holding great treasure as Paul says. Uh, when we think of the Franciscans, Julian Green called the Franciscan robe the color of earth and dust. I love that term. It's so beautiful. Would we have the courage to look like earth and dust to the world while inwardly greatly cherishing the glory of God that lives within? What Paul calls the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's in Colossians 1. It's hard to be earthenware. It's fragile. It gets fired in a kiln, uh, just as we get fired in the crucible of life's trials. A great number of the biblical passages involving pottery are negative. <laughs> if you look them up, you want to do a word search later. Um, there's a lot of references to pottery being dashed into pieces. And yet Paul uses that largely negative image from the Bible, known well to Jew and Gentile. Anybody that's owned pottery knows what happens to it. He chooses that image to describe the life and the way of the believer. Why? To be earthenware requires humility and trust. All earthenware has something in common. It has a shaper, a potter. Now, most of the time in this day and age, I think we're kind of strange clay. Uh, it seems like we refer to God as the sovereign potter when we want to give up and throw away our personal responsibility. I am as God made me. What can you do? Um, it's like calling God the potter while running as fast as we can from his potter's wheel and from the kiln. And I don't think that's the scriptural meaning. Uh, in the prophet Isaiah, the context is repentance, right? In Isaiah 64, 5 through 9, he says, You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. Yet, O Lord, you are our father, we are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember our iniquity forever. The prophet Jeremiah likewise speaks of God as shaping the humble and the proud. The humble are shaped for good, the proud for destruction. In Jeremiah 18, he says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Come, go down to the potter's house. And there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. Clay has to be shaped. And if we are the clay, we have no recourse but to trust the workmanship of the potter. In the church today throughout the world, it seems there is less trust in how the Lord works and more trust in what scholars or politicians, theologians even, or other professionals think. And it's hard to have faith if we are looking everywhere but to the one who can shape us. And it's hard to have faith. Here's the second kicker. It's hard to have faith if we are unwilling to be shaped, if we're too stubborn to be shaped. As Jeremiah says, just a few verses down, we can become like the unrepentant ones who say, it's no use, we will follow our own plans, 
and each of us will act according to the stubbornness of our evil will. That's not the way of the Lord. To be clay, we need to surrender to the Lord in all things. As Job says to his God, Your hands fashioned me and made me, and now you turn and destroy me. Remember that you fashioned me like clay, and will you turn me to dust again? You have granted me life and steadfast love, and your care has preserved my spirit. Humility means receiving the gracious shaping of the Lord in our lives instead of always trying to shape it ourselves. In classical studies, I came to learn one important Greek phrase. Exekia se poiese. That's about the only Greek you're ever going to hear me say. So. <laughs> I'm glad that moment's recorded. I don't know much Greek, sadly. I'm a terrible Greek scholar. Um, it means Exekius made me. Exekius signed his work. He was one of the greatest black figure potters of antiquity. Uh, today, those things, I think, are priceless. They're in museums. Uh, even in antiquity, I think they were quite valued. Um, and I do not think our dear apostle was thinking of elegant amphorae like this when he wrote to the Corinthians. I think the apostle was thinking of the common unsigned vessels that filled homes. In fact, in his letter to Timothy later on, he says, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says, In a large house, there are utensils not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some for special use, some for ordinary. Uh, all who cleanse themselves of the things I have mentioned will become special utensils, dedicated and useful to the owner of the house, ready for every good work. Shun youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with stupid and senseless controversies. You know they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kindly to everyone, an apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. Paul seems less concerned about the type of utensil you are. You might be clay, you might be silver, but you have to be useful and clean, dedicated to the owner ready for every good work. Our owner is our shaper and our cleanser, and we should be dedicated to him 24-7, ready for every good work that he would have us carry out. It doesn't matter if your name is remembered on this earth or not. Your name is remembered in heaven, and he does give us a new name or a secret name if we Take literally what he says in uh, Revelation. We are signed in a sense, but by the world's standards, we're unsigned common craftware. But we need to remember, it's not here that our name is important, but in heaven. Jesus told that to his disciples in Luke chapter 10. He said, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Our age is terrified of anonymity and non-recognition of working and living in the shadows. We want to have brands. We want to have social media profiles. We want an authoritative presence on the world stage. Boy, we're going to show them who Christ is. We're going to flash it with neon. The most useful things in your house today are likely unsigned. Um, some of them might have a little logo, but even today, screws, hand tools, kitchenware, tiles, nobody knows who made them, even if they have a logo. We don't know who made them. But you use them, and your life would be very difficult without them. Our lives need to be about what is necessary, not what is decorative, but about what is functional, not what is fashionable. In 2 Samuel uh, when David's in exile in chapter 17, we read about some gifts that are delivered to King David. And um, it's one of those lists that people probably just skip right over in the Bible because, oh, here are some boring details. Let's go on. 
I find this kind of stuff fascinating. Um, it says, when David came to Mahanaim, Shobi son of Nahash from Rabbah of the Ammonites, and Makir son of Amiel from Lodabar, and Barzillai the Gileadite from Rogelim, brought beds, basins, earthen vessels, wheat, barley, meal, parched grain, beans and lentils, honey and curds, sheep, and cheese from the herd for David and the people with him to eat. Among the provisions brought to the king in exile were articles of pottery. In the greatest time of his need, in one of his darkest moments, King David received gifts of earthenware along with the food provisions. Why? Because it's helpful and needful. You need it. Whether it's to serve out the food, whether it's to light, have lights, uh, to clean things, earthenware was necessary. I mean, even today, we still use it. 30,000 years later, since it's... Uh, appearance on earth. I want to return to our bedridden philosopher who delighted in a piece of stoneware, a work of common craft or folk art. In one of his essays, Yanagi Soetsu describes folk art in ways that almost sounds like a description of the kingdom of heaven as we read of it in the New Testament. He says, in this beauty, there is neither inordinate coloring nor notable deterioration. The shape of the object is simplicity itself. And they are decorated with only two or three patterns done in the most unpretentious manner. They contain no intellectual ambitions or attempts to be stylish. There is not the least effort to surprise or astonish. No straining to overachieve or striving for a particular form. They are simply quiet, calm, and tranquil. On occasion, these crafts seem to possess an almost humble, artless mien. They don't try to intimidate or coerce. In a day when the trend is toward showy display, we cannot help but feel a certain fondness for these simple, naive objects. Most of these handcrafts were produced in obscure, remote villages or in grungy workshops in the dim back streets of small towns. They were frequently seen in the calloused hands of the poor. They are simple things made of rough material. They are sold in small shops from straw mats on the roadside. They are used in cluttered rooms scattered about. But providence works in strange ways. These same factors have assured these objects of amazing beauty. In this, it's the same with religion, which reveres the virtue of poverty and remonstrates against the sin of pride. This is how such amazing beauty came to reside in such humble objects. Miscellaneous handicrafts are devoid of ambition. Just as construction workers who have built a wonderful highway don't sign their work, neither do artisans append their names to their wear. From beginning to end, without exception, such handicrafts are made by nameless craftsmen. It is this lack of desire for personal recognition that produces their flawless beauty. Among almost all artisans of the past were without academic training. What beauty was, how it came about, they knew nothing of this. They learned the tried and true ways of the past and patiently employed them without the slightest hesitation. There was no need for theory, no need to indulge in sentimentality. The beauty of miscellaneous handicrafts is the result of this single-mindedness, this unconscious devotion. Crafts that adhere to nature receive the blessings of nature. When natural conditions are not satisfied, craft work becomes weak and dull. Uh, the rich quality of common handicrafts is a gift of nature. To see its beauty is to see nature's spontaneous workings. But this is not all that material affects. It extends its influence to all shapes and all patterns between which there is an inseparable bond. A good cosmetic finish is not simply applied to an object, but submits to its natural needs. Nature tells the shape and pattern of material should assume, and nothing good can be achieved by ignoring its dictates. A good artisan seeks nothing that nature does not seek. This, I believe, is a view worth taking to heart. When one becomes a child of God, the flames of religious faith burn brightly. When one becomes a child of nature, 
one is encompassed by natural beauty that only nature can give. The more one returns to the bosom of nature, the more intense that beauty becomes. I apologize for the long-winded passage, but there's a lot in there that speaks to us. Again, this could be an analogy for the kingdom of heaven. Throughout the discussion, we could replace the word nature with spirit and find something very comparable to what Paul is constantly telling the Corinthian church in different ways. In the old common craftware shops, people single-mindedly gave themselves over to the work of producing their crafts, working honestly, humbly, anonymously, and yet masterfully to create what was needed for life in pre-industrial age. Through the seeming crudeness or simplicity of the common craftware came great functionality and beauty. When he was sick in bed and gazing at that stoneware vessel, Yanagi Soetsu was not merely looking at a pretty object. He was looking at the thriving, natural, and productive life of thousands and thousands of people, those who made and those who used the things made. Should not the church, through its hard work, humility, simplicity, and dedication to spiritual and natural truths, for both come from God, not also be able to show Jesus to the world through the simplest means. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. Our Lord and Savior was a common craftsman. He was a carpenter. In the body of Christ, its ministries, its testimony, must look like one person. It must all look like Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter. Because Jesus is the real treasure. We are the common vessels carrying him into the world. And perhaps the more we are willing to be earthenware, the more people will rejoice and value what we're carrying inside, the glorious treasure of Jesus within us. Amen. I'll encourage you to stand at this time and we will respond as the chorus kind of echoes what uh, Stephen was saying. Take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours.
these troubled times, I want to read a benediction from 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. Amen. Amen. <laughs> 